just let me know when you've all read it, and I'll start. Because some people are reading about still, yeah. Are we all okay? Yeah. All right, guys. So my name's Jack Nolan, and today I've come because Victoria's kindly, you know, invited me to come down and talk to you guys about my story, my mental health experiences, my own diagnosed dyslexia, and well, now dyslexia. I've just found out a few years ago, but it's still in the end, undiagnosed. But um, yeah, I'm going to hopefully try and inspire some of you, motivate some of you, empower some of you, and share a perspective or two that you may not have experienced before. So I'm going to jump straight into the deep end and share with you a poem. Now this poem I read when I was in a bit of a dark moment, but it's always kept me going through the go punk, going through strong. It's always been like a, a shining star for me that motivates me every day when I'm going through like the dark moments of my own mental health experiences. And it goes like this. Like a lion in a cage, my heart pumps, blood rages, ambition at the centre of my game, to conquer and defeat are my aims, trapped his eyes still attached to my past, yet I pursue whilst others laugh. I'm a champion, race to win, with the power in my bones and the voices within. I can, I will, I must. In this game, it's down to trust. To win is a must. For those who see no hope, I aspire to inspire when it's tough and they feel the rope. From darkness to light, I don't just do this for me, there ain't no might. I will conquer, I will fight, my enemies will fall and I take flight. Because I'm dangerous, I'm crazy, but I am a champion, it's how God made me. So my journey began years ago, well many years ago, I was in primary school and um, I used to be that scared, that nervous, that shy, very sensitive and afraid of the world. I used to you know, get bullied and picked on and I didn't have the best teachers to help support me. They used to say to me that I'd, I'd never be successful in life, I'd never achieved the goals that I wanted to because of how I was and how I behaved and how sort of much of an outcast I was. But when I got through primary school, I got into high school and I tried to reinvent myself. And through trying to reinvent myself, I tried to become the strongest version of person I could be. So I was struggling trying to fit in. I tried to be the cool kid. I tried to be like everybody, but I wasn't being myself. So when I started being myself, I realised that I had potential and I had everything I took to be the person that I wanted to be. So the maths teachers that I say to me that it's most important that you get maths if you want to succeed in, in life. So I knocked on the maths corridors doors and I tried to get some help. I was fortunate enough that one teacher believed in me and started giving me support with the maths. Even though I was struggling and fighting the maths, you know, doing algebra and times tables and all this sort of stuff, I was fighting a little bit like rocket, you know what I mean? Because it wasn't my best subject. So I was punching left, I was punching right, I was giving everything I could just to try and better myself. But come exam day, I got a D and I was gutted. You know, I was a bit down and that's when my mental health started to kick in a little bit. I thought, you know, to put all this stress on me and all this pressure on me to, to try and, you know, get this grade that means so much to the school system, but to myself, it was more about who I was becoming as a person, learning discipline, learning, you know, never giving up, learning always to try your best. And that's when I realised that this D meant something more than, you know, a failure. It meant determination, it meant discipline, it meant domination, it meant things that I could resonate with that would make me as a person become stronger, better and wiser. So from there, I ended up getting in, scraping my way into college and doing all sorts of different things. But one of the memories that stuck with me was when the careers advisor said to me, it's unrealistic for you, Jack, to believe that you're gonna be a writer, work in TV, work in the creative sector, do all these great things. And then I had to say to the world, look, miss, you might say it's unrealistic, but it's unrealistic for a lot of things in life like the light bulb, like airplanes, but fortunately, you know, these people didn't believe that and it really inspired me along the journey to keep going and keep going strong. So when I got into university, I'm oh sorry, yeah, I went through college, managed to scrape through there, and then I got the opportunity to go to university, which was an unconditional offer at Salford University. So it was quite, you know, a big thing for me at the time, but all my heart and soul wasn't, wasn't in the course what I was going into. The, even though it was TV radio, what I was passionate about, it was a uni life and the uni way that I wasn't 100% like, stuck to. But because of social pressures and because of what everyone was telling me, saying that university was the right way for me, 
I ended up falling into that sort of university trap, you could say. Even though education is massively important, but it just wasn't for me, that, that route. Because I was working in TV at the same time as, as being in university. And I was working with people like Lorraine Keller, Amity Khan, um, FK Twigs, Team GB. And I was working with all these amazing people and getting all these amazing experiences and working with a production company. You know, on the outside, I was living the dream and everything was amazing. But I started getting these conflicts and beliefs with, you know, teachers saying to me that I should stop missing lessons and, and stop working and focus on the degree. And they had my TV mate saying to me, just, it's all right, we've, we've not got degrees, but we've done all right, just follow our path. And then they had, you know, my friends telling me one thing, and then they had personal relationships and all these different things and factors and stresses in my life going on at the same time, which led to me having my first mental health breakdown, which was called the psychosis episode. Now that was a sad time for me because I'm a psychosis episode, it's when you lose touch with reality and you experience a lot of difficult and sad things such as you know, racing thoughts, strange beliefs, um, a lot of different sort of factors that contributed to me becoming really unwell and before you knew it I was ended up in hospital. Now when I was in hospital I was scared, I was frightened, I didn't know what was going on while I was sat there in A&E and the doctors told me, go take this tablet and it will, it, will, it will save you, it will help you, it will get you back on track. I took the tablet and it knocked me out. In reality, I just went in an ambulance, they put me in an ambulance and they whizzed me to a mental health hospital. And I thought, whilst I was in this unconscious state and I didn't know where I was or what was going on, I thought I had died and gone to heaven. So when I woke up, I thought I was in heaven. I was walking around and I was like, wow, what is going on here? I see these bright lights I'm looking around there and I see strangers, don't see my family and I'm to my left and thinking, yo, is this the three wise men? And I'm to my right, I'm like, is this Jesus Christ? And I'm starting to question all the people who are around there and I'm starting to really seriously be like the furthest down the rabbit hole you can imagine. And it was a very scary time for me. It was a very, very self-awareness time for me as well because I was learning about myself, but I was like so delusional and so gone that it was hard for me to find what was real and what wasn't real. And that's when I started to really deteriorate and be ever worse. I started to smash my room up, I started to smash things up and destroy things and really sort of like be in a manic state. And then the penny sort of dropped for me where I was. When I was sat down on a couch and I was, I was listening to a guy talk on the phone and he was ordering a takeaway and he was getting frustrated. And I was funny as this might seem, but I tell you, and he shouted down the phone saying, I'm in a mental asylum. Now that's when a penny dropped from there. I was like, oh my God, that's, this is where I actually am. So I'm not in heaven. And this little maze what I'm stuck in, it's all, it's not real. And then that's when I thought, you know what? I need to get myself sorted now. I know where I am. And it's a shock to the system. So I rang my parents and I said, look, mum, dad, I can't believe you put me in there. I can't believe you, you know, you've locked me up in a mental asylum with these people who are strange and they're doing these weird behaviours and there's fighting and there's all the stuff going on. I feel like I was in a prison. I was in my prison in my mind and a prison in the physical space. And it was a very scary experience for me. And my parents came rushing to see me as quick as they could because I knew that I was really distressed and upset with what, the, what I've just found out for myself. So when I was like sat there on my dark days and I was trying to find the light, I looked to people in that hospital who were suffering as well. He was really suffering with their own pains, with their own demons, with their own trials and tribulations that was going on in their mind. And what I did was, I started helping them. I started saying to them these positive messages. Sorry, I'm a bit dry, man. Sorry about that. So I started saying to them these messages. I said, listen, I said, you can become anything you want in this world, anything you want in this life. I said, if, the, if you're in darkness, let me be the North Star. Let me get you through this, uh, this situation that you're facing right now because I'm going through the same emotions what you're going through. I'm going through the same pains that you're going through. But we can help each other. We can all get through these dark times and we can all make a difference with whatever it is, with what our dreams are. I said, you've all got the spirit and the strength of a lion. And that's where the doctors came ran up to me and said, Jack, do you believe you're a lion? I said, no, I'm not scared. I'm not going to move fast. I'm not going to or anything like that. I said, I just believe. You've all got the spirit and the strength and the passion of a lion. And a lion is like a creature that is the king of the jungle. And in that hospital, 
I started to believe I was the king of that environment. I started helping people, I started serving people, I started doing poems for them, I started giving them everything I've got to let them know that it's going to be okay and that I will be the North Star of them in the best way that I possibly can. So, after being told that I could be locked up in there for a year, I ended up proving the doctors wrong and coming out 19 days later. But my journey didn't end there and I was still stuck. I was still trapped in my own little bubble because I was suffering with anxiety. I was suffering with being ashamed. I was suffering with having this em the emotional breakdown as well as a breakdown in my mental health. I was suffering with all these different factors and life threw another curveball at me. My relationship for five years had just ended. So I had a broken heart and a broken mind at the same time. And it was really distressful. It was really a lot of pain that I was going through. And I had to really try to get myself out of the rut that I was in. And I was stuck on the couch for like six months. Just sat on a couch like this one here, right? And I was, I was, it was, it was a massive achievement for me to get out of bed and to get to that couch. That's how serious my situation was. Getting outside the house was another achievement that I had to get build up. Going to the shop just to buy a chocolate bar, that was a massive achievement. But I was scared to phone my mates and say, do you fancy a drink? Do you fancy going out? That was a massive achievement for me just to even pick up the phone and say to him, do you fancy going out? I was scared, I was scared to cross the road. My dad would take me for walks and he'd give me his motivational speeches as much as I was giving to other people. And he was saying to me, Jack, you know, you're about 10% right now, but listen, Next week we're going to get you to 20%. And each week that goes by, we're going to get you a little bit better, a little bit better, and you're going to come back 10 times stronger than what you already are right now. So that really inspired me and lifted me up. But I needed something to get up for when I was in the morning. I needed something to give me motivation. Because when my mum and dad was at work, even though my mum sacrificed giving up a job to support me, I needed extra motivation to help me get out of bed. And that was by getting this book that you see with me today published. Now, before it had sat on the couch, like me really, like a shelf, we sat on the shelf, just collecting dust and rejection, letter after rejection. But I got laser focused this time. The product stayed the same. I never changed any words in the book. But what I did was I changed my mindset. And that was the biggest factor what I did. So I got laser focused on a publisher that I wanted to work with. And I kept bringing them week by week for a period of five weeks. So I bring him a couple of times within that week. I say, my name is Jack Nolan. I say, I've got a great book here. I'd love to see what your opinion is. I'd love to see what your thoughts are. I'd love to see what you think. And then it'd go like that for a period of five weeks, just getting laser focused like a sniper. I knew what my target was. I knew what I wanted. And I was like, you know, pulling the metaphorical trigger on my dreams to become a reality. After five weeks, I got a meeting. I sat down with a publisher in town. It was like some out of a movie. And I thought, these things just don't happen to people like me. I'm just a normal kid like every one of you guys. And it was really something that was motivating and inspiring to me because I thought, I cracked the code. All it was was being more persistent, more focused, and more driven. And what I did was, I ended up signing that contract. Now, this wasn't going to make me JK Rowling overnight, but it was a step in the right direction. It was a positive step. And three months later, we did a book launch. And that book launch, we sold 100 books. Again, that's not a massive number, but it was 100 people's lives that I had touched and had an impact in, which really inspired me and kept me going and moving forward. From there, I had the battle with Waterstones, and I wanted to be on the shelf. So what I did was, I went in with Big Millie's cookies and donuts and chocolate bars and I'd pile up all the stuff and get another treat and I'd look after them. And then before you know it, I got the attention of the regional manager and the regional manager said to me, Jack, what are you doing? I, I, who, who is this kid? Are you the publisher? I said, no, I'm not a publisher. I said, I'm just an author. Well, a new author, you could say. I went, my dream is to get on this shelf because I want to inspire people that anything really is possible, that a kid from North Manchester can go on to do great things at such a young age. So what I did was, I started selling in the dream, selling in the passion, and I didn't give up, and I didn't leave Watchstones until they put me on the shelf and made the order. That's how determined you've got to be sometimes in life. And that's how you've got to, what you've got to do to try and get things done. And it takes a lot of time, a lot of confidence, a lot of courage, a lot of heart. Also, at the same time, I'm doing this. I'm shaking while I'm talking to them a little bit. My anxiety is flying wild. My depression started to kick in. What if it's not work? What if it's not work? My paranoia is kicking in. But what you've got to do is you've got to take control of you. And it's really hard to do that sometimes. I know what it's like when you're sat there and you can't get out of bed. I know what it's like when 
all the, you know, everything seems dark, but you, what you've got to do is push yourself through as best you can, because if you don't, then you're going to regret not putting in the work that you want for yourself, you're going to regret not, not going after your dreams, and it's not about achieving them, it's about the person you become, the process of the climb that it takes for you to become whatever your definition of success is. It's not about money, it's not about being a millionaire, it's about you, your mental well-being, your state, your happiness, your fulfillment and who you are, that's what it's about. And that's what makes you become the strongest person possible. Now, on the rise from the success of the book and everything that was exciting in my life, the walks on experience, I ended up running faster and faster towards conquering more dreams and conquering more goals. So I started working it again in TV, I started working in a documentary uh, production company and I was coming up with ideas and I loved all the creativity side and I was getting to use myself and feel valuable in the workplace. But after I came out of that, I started to spread my message online that you can become anything you want and sharing my story, sharing my passion with people and then from there things started to get a bit more busy, started to get more people interacting with me from all over the world and things was getting quite exciting but before you knew it paranoia started to kick in and it was the things that I was hearing on the streets, it was people who I looked up to who was friends making criminal moves that created a lot of paranoia in me it really frightened me, really scared me, scared me to the point that I was so paranoid that I ended up getting locked up again in hospital for the second time. Now, the second time I thought, you know what, why me? Why me out of all people? I'm not trying to hurt anyone, I'm not trying to do anything wrong, I'm just trying to better myself, I'm not trying to help people. Why am I in this situation? The question was, I was really unwell and I didn't realise it. I didn't know how far gone I had gone in my mental health that I was suffering with bipolar and I didn't know it. I didn't know that I had bipolar until the doctor said to me, you know what Jack, you've got, you've been, we're gonna diagnose you with bipolar. And I, I was in denial, I thought, I'm not got bipolar, I'm not crazy, there's nothing wrong with me. Okay, I've had some negative experiences, I've had some you know, experiences in my past that I'm not favorable of, I'm not passionate about in saying, you know, I've been through psychosis, I've been through a manic episode and all these serious things. I wasn't proud to be able to say that, but what I am now is proud to say that I am the person who's gone through all these experiences and when I was in the hospital, being able to say, you know what, all of the experiences have made me who I am as a person. It's given me value, it's given me something to share, it's given me a story to tell, it's given me a way to change and impact people's lives, which is something that meant a lot to me. So when I was in that hospital, I went back to my roots, started helping people and after a few weeks of getting myself back on track, he allowed me to go out of the hospital. And when the hospital allowed me to go out, I bought chocolates, I bought sweets. I had, this is a long time since I had anything, you know, nice. Or whether my parents bring things in for me. But I had a little bit of spend that my mum gave me. And I bought the whole shop more or less. I went into that hospital, started giving out sweets, chocolate bars, everything you can think of. I tried to make it like Charlie in the chocolate factory because I knew how dark that place was. And how stressed other people was in there. And I seen people in there who was you know, suicidal, I seen people in there who was fighting with each other, I seen people in there who was, you know, going through a lot of difficulties, and I started saying to them the same message that I had to believe in myself. I said, you can become anything you want in this world, you can be anything you want, you know, I am the North Star in my own life, and I can be the North Star for you in your lives, I said, there's greatness in you, you've got everything that it takes to be the person that you need to be in this world, and I just went on and on and on, giving them as much passion and and as much energy as I could to try and break them out of their cycles. And through doing that, it gave me therapy because I was expressing myself, I was sharing my story, I was saying it's, it's okay, you know what I mean? I've been in this situation before, I know it's the first time for some of you guys, but I got out last time and we can get out again and we can walk out together hand in hand. And I knew it, and I started to see people who started to leave the hospital before me and I thought, hang on a minute, when's it my <laughs> turn? You know what I mean? I thought, I've just given them a big motivational speech every single day and I've supported them and, and as that interlude you put me about what's wrong with me? But I was still unwell, I was still wasn't 100%, my parents knew it, the doctors knew it, but I was on the right track and I was on the right path to get myself back to a positive mental state. So some of the things I learned in the hospital was holding on to a vision. 
I'd made vision boards. I put pictures of myself on the wall. I put my ideas on the walls. I put everything out I could imagine and dream on the walls. Where doctors would say to me, well, that's a bit you know, delusional that you're going to speak before people and share your story on a stage. To which I did, 12 months later. Just because someone can't see in your dream and your reality what you wish for yourself, doesn't mean that you're delusional. You've got to ask yourself a few things. You've got to say, do I, am I out to hurt anyone or do anything bad? No. Is it a bit pie in the sky? Okay, maybe it's a quite a bit of ambition. But if that ambition and inspiration of your dreams inspires you to keep going, don't let anyone take the dreams that you have away from you. Keep working towards that dream. Because like I said, you become stronger in the process of chasing that dream and the person you become on that mission that you set yourself. So when I got out of hospital, I had to give myself no purpose yet again because I knew the mistakes that I made in the past and the mistakes that I made in the past was not giving myself a purpose quick enough and what I did was I started writing my second book Dead Ends which is not a plug but it's coming out this December <laughs> so uh, I started writing that book and I started giving everything I could you know, trying to get myself up and motivating and getting myself in the right positive mental attitude and state of mind to keep myself on track and then my dad said to me well, not just my dad, my mum, my family and everyone, they said, why don't you go to a mental health charity? And I said, oh, you know, I don't really want to go to a mental health charity. And um, I was a bit nervous and scared. And I didn't want to admit it. I didn't want to admit the fact that walking through that charity doors was a big thing to me, because my anxiety was sky high. I was experiencing this new thing called bipolar. And I didn't know if it would fit in, and I've always been a bit of an outcast, and I thought, going to a mental health charity, it might not be the right thing for me. In my head, this was a story I was telling myself, but I was fortunate enough that my dad helped change that story for me. So I walked in, and I said, you know what, I'm going to give it a go. Giving it a go was the best thing I ever did. I started to meet new people, started to develop myself, started to become more confident, started to raise awareness of mental health through sharing my stories through their platforms, meeting the right people, I uh, was fortunate enough to meet people from like Barclays and Lloyds and banks and you know big companies like Camelot who really supported their charity and without realising I was selling my dream to them and they invited me to speak at their events and it was a little bit like you know the big American events that you see and stuff like that where the big stages and lights and all flashy stuff going on and to me that was like wow this is a dream come true it was only 12 months ago I was thinking about all this I didn't know I was going to get there but I eventually got there and it just shows you that in life you don't know which way you're going to go, you don't know which way you're going to turn, but if you've got a vision in your head, you somehow connect the dots together to make your dreams become a reality. And it doesn't happen overnight. You know, my, success, my success story is back fast. It doesn't mean everyone's going to be the same, but what it does mean is you become the best version of yourself when you've got a dream, you've got a mission, you've got a passion, you get up every day in the morning, you fight the demons, you, you wrestle to get yourself out of bed, you wrestle to get yourself ready, but you know what you do? You keep fighting. You keep fighting. So if you stop fighting, you lose. And it's all and there's a hundred and one reasons why all of you could not turn up tonight, but you did. So in my eyes, you're all winners. Every single one of you. Because what it takes to be a winner is showing up. And this morning, I'm gonna be honest with you, I didn't feel like being a winner showing up but because it's who I am I did now I'm gonna wrap it up there and end on another poem which I read again in another dark place in my mind a few years ago before I was diagnosed with all this mental health stuff I thought I'd be great here, but maybe I was a little bit mad <laughs> so here goes it's easier to be a spectator to sit on the couch and watch something greater when a lot of work goes unseen, people underestimate the power of a man's dream. They believe in the wrong ideologies, questioning why they can never be. When a lot of work goes into the dark that's never seen, that's why people curse and say that life's mean, that it's done them wrong. While the other man's working all day long, from spectator to hater, false beliefs don't make them any greater. I'm the type of guy to slay down any slater, to look him in the eye and define him as a hater. Stone cold walls chained to a cell. I'm seeing people chasing money and it doesn't end well. That's why gangsters die or end up in hell. You see, I'm too defined. With blood money in my past, I'm the new breed. Here to last. So if you want to get to know me, pull up a seat. I'm a storyteller and I can tell you about beef. But my lessons and experiences exist for a reason, not just a gig. For in the shh, jokes, comedy, stick. 
unknown and you'll never know who I am. I'm that voice of power, the definition of a true man. I teach, I preach and I lead the way. I exist for that kid who's too quiet to say, because one day he will wake and he will become something, just like all of you guys. Thank you for your time today. And if any of you want to ask any questions, please do. Stay, I wouldn't be here. If it wasn't for the you know, support from Victoria, I wouldn't be here. If it wasn't for that little conversation that we had earlier, I wouldn't be here. If it weren't for all you guys, again, I wouldn't be here. So the support that I've had from other people is massive. And if it wasn't for all of them, like the charities, uh, the big organisations that I've met, you know, I wouldn't be on this journey that I want. So thank you for that question. Um, how did you know these sort of support? I had to be really brave, that was the honest truth, you know, because I was in a vulnerable position and, and you, for some time you think you can fight the world all by yourself, but you can't, you can't be a lone wolf and even wolves have a pack, you know what I mean? So you've got to be brave enough to walk through them doors and reach out and say, help me, there's no shame in it, you know what I mean, there's no, you know, there's nothing negative about it and I went to a charity called 40 Second Street and they're based in Manchester. Uh, you can get access to them through Google and through 40 Second Street, but there's other charities and organisations out there that will be just as good as the one that I went to. Are you scared of people that are powerful to own that? I do think about it, but what I've learned is with my condition, you either high, low, or sometimes you can completely lose track of where you are. <laughs> <laughs> But what keeps me going is my rituals, and they, they're very small, but they mean a lot to me. And it is to, to be in control of my own mind as best as I can. And that is through listening to like positive tapes, um, positive psychology stuff, um, listening to my parents, you know what I mean, listening to my family, and trying to be the best version I can every day. And that creates a little bit of anxiety because I have this, this expectation of being the best now all the time. But it helps me have an awareness of who I am and the journey that I'm on. So I do get scared, you know what I mean? I do get scared because sometimes I think, what if I'm in a really bad place and I've got to show up to an event like this or somewhere else and what if I can't get through it, you know what I mean? So that's what worries me is letting people down if I'm not in the most well state to speak, you know what I mean? So that's what I worry about sometimes. Thank you. No worries. And so, do you have any triggers? Like, do you know like, when you're going to start in again and like, how to control them triggers? Or do you just stay positive? Well, one of my triggers is, is not having enough sleep. Without, sleep is massively important. And without me trying to keep track of my sleep and work, overworking myself is another trigger. Like, if, I, if I'm going too hard and I'm running too fast and I'm, I'm becoming overwhelmed by where I'm going, that can be a trigger for me to sort of say, right, I need to slow down now. You know what I mean? Because if I recognise that my thoughts are racing too quick, my mum and dad pick up on it, you know what I mean? Because they'll, they'll see me talking 100 miles an hour and they'll start to see me going really fast in my mind. If I've not got control over myself one day at a time, 
man, you know, it's, it's really, I'm in a bad place, you know what I mean? I, I, I risk being...